You will hear a conversation between two students about buying a used car. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Hello. Hello. Can I speak to Eleanor, please? This is Eleanor speaking. Hi. My name is Jan. I'm calling about the car that was advertised on the notice board in the student union building. Is it still for sale? Yes, it is. Your ad says it's a 1985 Celica, in good condition. It's old, but it has been well looked after. My family has had the car for ten years. I'm just the third owner, and my mother had it before me, so we know its history. We've got all the receipts and records. It's had regular maintenance, and the brakes were done last year. It runs really well, but looks its age. Why are you selling it, by the way? Well, I'm going overseas next month to study. I'll be away for at least two years, so I have to sell it. Unfortunately, it's been a good car. You want fifteen hundred dollars? Is that right? I was asking two thousand dollars, but since I need to sell it quickly, I've reduced the price. Would you like to come and take it for a drive? I don't live far from the university. Yes, I'd like to have a look. What time would suit you? Any time this evening is fine. Um. Well, I finish classes at six o'clock. How about straight after that? Say six thirty. Great. I'll give you directions. When you leave the main gate of the university, turn left on South Road and keep going until you get to the Grand Cinema. Take the first right. That's Princess Street. I'm at number eighty-eight on the right. So it's eighty Princess Street. No, it's eighty-eight Princess Street, and the suburb is Parkwood. You'll see the car parked in front. It's the red one with the for sale sign on it. Okay. Thanks, Eleanor. I'll see you later. Bye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Later that day, at the university, Jan meets up with her friend Sam, and tells him about the car. Hi, Sam. Hey, Jan. What's happening? I'm glad I ran into you. I've decided I have to get a car. You're going to buy a car? Do you really need one? I'd probably still be driving, except that my car broke down last year. Instead of getting another one, I just moved closer to the university and went back to riding a bike. Better for the environment, better for my health, and I save a lot of money. Did it really cost that much? Well, when you think of registration, insurance, rising petrol costs, parking, plus maintenance and repairs, it adds up.、Mm, I know it's going to be expensive, but I really need my own transportation. It takes half an hour by bus each way to university, as it is. But now I'm working at night in the city. There's no way I want to hang around waiting for a bus late at night, then walk three blocks home alone. Hey, I think you've got a point there. So, what kind of car are you looking at? It's an eighty-five Celica, same kind as I used to have. The owner's asking fifteen hundred dollars. That's pretty old. How many kilometres has it done? You know, I forgot to ask. I'll have to check tonight when I go to see it. Would you be able to come with me to have a look at about six thirty? Sure, I'll come. But I don't know a lot about cars. I do know one thing, though. I wouldn't buy an old car without having a mechanic look at it first. That's a good idea. But won't it cost a lot? 
Not really. You can get a check done through the Automobile Association for $80, and it comes with a report on the condition of the car. It can save you a lot of money in the long run. I'll keep that in mind. So we have to get to Parkwood at 6.30. Do you want to take the bus? It goes straight down South Road every 15 minutes. Or maybe we could walk. I don't think it's that far. Actually, I could borrow my roommate's motorbike for an hour or so. He's working all evening in the library. Do you think he'd mind? No way. He owes me a favour or two. OK, great. See you at six, outside the student centre. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a tutor and two students discussing modern European writers. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. OK, so to continue our look at modern European writers who have focused on the future in their work, today we're talking about H.G. Wells. Last week, I asked you both to do some background research on Wells, which we're going to discuss now. Gitanjali, tell us about H.G. Wells. Right. So, H.G. Wells was a hugely successful British science fiction writer. Writing at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, and much of his work focused on predicting the future. Jason, do you think Wells was just using the future as a narrative device in his fiction? No, no. He really believed we can predict the future. In fact, he gave a speech at the Royal Institution in London in 1902 called The Discovery of the Future, and the point he was making was that by looking at what you know about the present and about science, it's quite possible to predict the future. Indeed. Gitanjali, do you think Wells was always optimistic in his predictions? Not at all. In fact, he varied in his predictions from being extremely pessimistic about the future to being optimistic. Interestingly, one theory I read links the attitude in Wells's work to his own health. When he was writing The Time Machine, which was published in 1895, he'd just been diagnosed with an incurable fatal disease. Not surprisingly, the book is very pessimistic. Being about a dystopia in the future, a long time in the future, the year 802-701, in fact, where there are two races on Earth, the Morlocks and the Eloi, and the Morlocks actually eat the Eloi. I thought it was interesting, though, that it was H.G. Wells who actually came up with the phrase time machine. So despite being pessimistic, the work has had a lasting effect on our culture. Right. After the time machine, though, H.G. Wells didn't die, of course. And his recovery might be why he began to be a bit more optimistic about the future. So that brings us to his first utopia, Anticipations. Jason, tell us about that. Well, Anticipations, or to give it its full title, Anticipations of the Reaction of the Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Scientific Thought, was published in 1901 and was set in the New Republic of the year 2000. 
some of the things Wells predicts are fairly close to our reality today, including 24-hour news, global telecommunications, and even a European Union. We'll come back to the accuracy of Wells's predictions a little later. Gitanjali, how was Wells's work received at the time? Well, although Wells was extremely successful, not everyone respected his work or his predictions. Another well-known science fiction writer, Jules Verne, viciously attacked him for works such as The First Man in the Moon, which Verne argued weren't rooted in scientific fact at all. That's right. Now, Wells wrote a number of other utopian visions of the future. Jason? Yes. In a modern utopia published in 1905, his vision was of a world where there's no private property, where everyone has access to wonderful health care, and interestingly, where everyone's personal information is stored on cards in a central database outside Paris. Apart from the healthcare, I'm not sure everyone today would see that as a positive view of the future. Neither am I. And, on a similar note, Wells strongly believed in population control and in The Shape of Things to Come, which was published in 1933, he sees and supports a world where the population is kept at 2 billion. Once again, I'm not sure most people today would necessarily see that as a good thing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Gitanjali, in your research, did you come across anything about the world brain? Yes, I did. It's actually very interesting. Throughout the 1930s, Wells predicted and supported the setting up of a huge world encyclopedia. And towards the end of the decade, in 1938, he wrote a series of essays called World Brain. In these essays, he called for the world to make use of modern technology to create an enormous global encyclopedia so that all our knowledge is available to all people, not just an educated elite. Wells envisioned this as probably being on microfilm. He thought it would allow anyone, anywhere in the world, to look at any book or any document. He also thought it would be created by everyone, once again, not just by an elite. Yes, and as you can imagine, many people today say that the Internet has basically fulfilled his prediction. Of course, it doesn't use microfilm, but essentially, it does meet all Wells's main requirements. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 26. 
Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for 20 years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university, even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television program last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip, Professor Nitik. Could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> An average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon, and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of two thousand and one. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show.
We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Hear an extract from a talk given by a lecturer from management department of a university on the topic job satisfaction. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Job satisfaction is how happy an individual is with his or her job. Scholars and human resource professionals generally make a distinction between effective job satisfaction and cognitive job satisfaction. Effective job satisfaction is the overall extent of pleasurable emotional feelings individuals have about their jobs and is different from cognitive job satisfaction which is the extent of individual satisfaction with particular facets of their jobs such as pay, pension, arrangements, working hours and numerous other aspects of their jobs. At its most general level of conceptualization, job satisfaction is simply how content an individual is with his or her job. Effective job satisfaction is usually defined as a one-dimensional subjective construct representing an overall emotional feeling individuals have about their job as a whole. Hence, effective job satisfaction for individuals reflects the degree of pleasure or happiness their job in general induces. Cognitive job satisfaction is usually defined as being a more objective and logical evaluation of various facets of a job. As such, cognitive job satisfaction can be one-dimensional if it comprises evaluation of just one aspect of a job, such as pay or maternity leave, or multidimensional if two or more facets of a job are simultaneously evaluated. Environmental Factors one of the most significant aspects of an individual's work in a modern organization concerns the management of communication demands that he or she encounters on the job. Demands can be characterized as a communication load. Individuals in an organization can experience communication overload and communication underload, which can affect their level of job satisfaction. Communication overload can occur when an individual receives loads of message in a short period of time which can result in unprocessed information or when an individual faces more complex messages that are more difficult to process. Due to this process, given an individual's style of work and motivation to complete a task, when more inputs exist than outputs, the individual perceives a condition of overload which can be positively or negatively related to job satisfaction. In comparison, communication under load can occur when messages or inputs are sent below the individual's ability to process them. According to the ideas of communication over load and under load, if an individual does not receive enough input on the job or is unsuccessful in processing these inputs, 
the individual is more likely to become dissatisfied, aggravated and unhappy with their work that leads to a low level of job satisfaction. Superior subordinate communication Superior subordinate communication is an important influence on job satisfaction in the workplace. The way in which subordinates perceive a superior's behavior can positively or negatively influence job satisfaction. Communication behavior such as facial expression, eye contact, vocal expression and body movement is crucial to the superior subordinate relationship. Nonverbal messages play a central role in interpersonal interactions with respect to impression formation, deception, attraction, social influence and emotional bonding. Individuals who dislike and think negatively about their supervisor are less willing to communicate or have motivation to work whereas individuals who like and think positively of their supervisor are more likely to communicate and are satisfied with their job and work environment. A supervisor who uses non-verbal immediacy, friendliness and open communication lines is more likely to receive positive feedback and high job satisfaction from a subordinate. Strategic employee recognition Employee recognition is not only about gifts and points. It's about changing the corporate culture in order to meet goals and initiatives and most importantly to connect employees to the company's core values and beliefs. Strategic employee recognition is seen as the most important program not only to improve employee retention and motivation but also to positively influence the financial situation. The vast majority of companies want to be innovative coming up with new products, business models and better ways of doing things. However, innovation is not so easy to achieve. A CEO cannot just order it and so it will be achieved. You have to carefully manage an organization so that over time innovations will emerge. Individual factors Mood and emotions form the effective element of job satisfaction. Moods tend to be long-lasting but often weaker states of uncertain origins while emotions are often more intense, short-lived and have a clear object or cause. Positive and negative emotions were also found to be significantly related to overall job satisfaction. It was found that suppression of unpleasant emotions decreases job satisfaction and the amplification of pleasant emotions increases job satisfaction. There are two personality factors related to job satisfaction, alienation and locus of control. Employees who have an internal locus of control and feel less alienated are more likely to experience job satisfaction, job involvement and organizational commitment. The characteristics like high self-esteem, self-efficacy and low neuroticism are also related to job satisfaction.